so we, we begin today um, kind of leading off where we were last time, and that is talking about the processes by which polymers are made. So I mentioned on Friday that there were two types of polymers. There was the addition polymer, and the addition polymer was formed by just linking the same repeating unit over and over and over and over and over again. And if we look at examples of addition polymers, we can see that repetition. We can see in polyethylene here that the same two carbon group repeats itself over and over and over again. We can see in vinyl chloride, the same two carbon group, the one that has that chlorine at the one position here, repeats itself over and over and over again. And for acrylonitrile, same thing. We've got this uh, cyano group repeating over and over and over again. Tetrafluoroethylene, we can see it looks very similar to polyethylene. The only difference is that we've replaced it all those hydrogens with chlorine, but again, over and over, the cycle repeats and repeats and repeats. So that's what addition polymers are all about. We've got the same unit repeating over and over and over again. This might repeat 100 times, this might repeat 1,000 times, this might repeat 10,000 times. This depends upon the nature of the building materials and how much of those materials we have. Now there is another kind of polymerization. It's called a condensation polymer. And in the condensation polymer process, what we will find is that we are going to attach two different molecules to each other in a repeating pattern. Molecule A, then molecule B, then A again, then B again, then A again, then B again, over and over and over and over and over. And as A and B link up with each other, what we're going to see is that they're going to drop little chemical markers along the way. Usually those chemical markers are things like water or ammonia. So we're getting H2O or NH3 coming off of these substances as they react. And the reactions themselves come from certain types of organic materials. We're usually talking about Alcohol, if we had an OH group on the carbon chain, we could be talking about acid. Which has something called a carboxyl group. on the end of the chain. Or we could be looking at either something that has an amine or a mide, where we either have And this is where the nitrogen would come from if it were dropping ammonia. So, um, as we talked about in a couple of places this semester, most organic molecules are just carbons and hydrogens and, and sometimes oxygens um, hanging around. And so, in these kinds of compounds, there's lots of oxygen and oxygen. So, 
dropping a water molecule along the way, it happens. But to have an ammonia, which is a little bit more of a unusual circumstance, you have to have one of these ammonia groups on it. You have to have either an amide or an amide, um, which is going to present another different set of factors when it comes to emergency response and other kinds of things. So here we have a couple of examples. We have something called ethylene glycol. You can see that this is an alcohol group. It only has the OHs. And we have paraphthalic acid. You can see that each of these have that carboxylic group on the end. And you can see that if I look at this part of the compound, that's my repeating unit. And I can break that repeating unit down into its two pieces. Here was the former acid on the left and the former alcohol on the right. What's missing from the alcohol? The hydrogen. What's missing from the acid? The OH group. Put the H and the OH together. And there's where those water molecules are dropping off as they link up. So as this condensation reaction is taking place, they link up. And they drop these little water molecules along the way. Now, the name of the polymer, polyethylene paraphthalate, well, PET, that is a very common um, plastic. Phenol and formaldehyde do something very similar. You can see that we have a repeating unit um, piece. And in that repeating unit piece, <clears throat> what we are noting is that the formaldehyde is basically the thing that is attaching um, at multiple places on this carbon ring. And it's making a crisscross pattern. It's actually the OH group is pointing up in the one that we circled. It's pointing down on the adjoining one, and it's pointing up again, and down again. Uh, so this one's a little bit different, but if you look closely along the way, you'll see that what we are missing, what, what's getting dropped along the way in this case, uh, are hydrogen, and oxygen, so water again is a byproduct of these. Now, a lot of these starting materials are relatively unstable on their own. And some of them can undergo what we would call spontaneous polymerization. Another way of talking about that is something called autopolymerization. Now, these can happen for a lot of reasons, um, but the primary reasons that we see it are increases in temperature and pressure. Now, how do we get the stopping of autopolymerization to take place? It's usually through the introducing other substances that will separate those molecules from each other. So if we're talking about substances that are potentially gaseous, we can add non-reactive gases, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. We can also, if it's more of a solid or liquid phase, we can introduce the same thing, 
non-reactive liquids or solids or um, in more common cases, an active inhibitor, something that prevents the polymerization, that chain reaction from starting in the first place. Um, Perfume hydroquinone is an example of those. <clears throat> So auto polymerization can happen for a variety of different products. It happens in the fuels industry, um, especially if you look at long chain kinds of carbon fuels like uh, high diesel. Um, you'll know that um, most of the storage capacity for those has kind of a shelf life to it. Um, and the main reason is that they can kind of gum up. Um, if they're left sitting too long in the wrong kind of container. Well, that gumming up that's taking place, that's polymerization. The large carbon molecules inside of that diesel fuel, um, especially in extreme temperature changes, will start to kind of fuse together. And if that goes into the diesel engine, it locks it up. Um, so you put in additives to try to separate those molecules from each other to prevent that from happening. Now, when it comes to the actual reactions of some of these polymers, what we have to understand is that most of the products that we are dealing with, most plastics, most fibers, they're going to be ignitable. They're made out of some kind of organic material. Natural fibers are made from organic material that come from animals or plants. Um, synthetic things like plastics are petroleum based. They're made from um, crude oil that has been reprocessed. So at their heart, they're carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen for the most part. And those compounds and those combinations are usually quite flammable. Now, depending upon what it is, we will see a variety of different kinds of reactions to keep in flames. Some will just simply melt and rip. Some will decompose, go back to their original monomers. A good number of polymers will actually char, turn black and kind of hard and crusty as they burn. These kinds of polymers are extremely energy dense. So when they burn, they burn very hot. And because they are so dense in terms of their fuel capacity, their burning capability is usually limited by the oxygen around them. So we rarely see complete combustion with these kinds of polymers because there's just not enough oxygen around to burn off all of the carbon and hydrogen. So as we talked about when we talked about flame chemistry, when there isn't sufficient oxygen, the reaction starts taking shortcuts. Those shortcuts come in the forms of yellow sooty flames, smoke, and usually dangerous gases, toxic gases. So things like carbon monoxide, depending upon what else is in the polymer, you can find other things like um, cyanide groups, hydrogen chloride, chlorine gas, a good bit of, of that kind of stuff. So when we are exposed to a considerable amount of fire from a polymer standpoint it is usually the gas and the smoke that we have to be the most aware of and the most concerned with. Um, obviously, because these polymers are carbon-based, first and foremost, they are going to have carbon monoxide byproducts. That has been the most common and the most dangerous gas of them. Uh, because of the commonality, because of 
uh, how much carbon monoxide could be made by these high carbon fuels. But again, like I said, just based on what the plastic or fabric is, you can have some of these other products in there as well. So if it contains chlorines, hydrogen chloride, which we know is a particularly nasty gas that is also a corrosive, that can be evolved. We can find ammonia, anytime there's nitrogen involved. We can find hydrogen cyanide, uh, those uh, acrylonitrile compounds that have the cyanide group on them. Hydrogen cyanide can come off when they burn. Sulfur-based compounds can come off, like sulfur dioxide. Um, nitrogen dioxide can come off when we have nitrogen-based products as well. So you get those amines and those amides. We can see things like ammonia and nitrogen dioxide coming up. So burning up these colors can be a really nasty kind of endeavor. This is why we don't throw plastics of any kind into a burn barrel or a fire of some kind. Because the, the, the ramifications of it are either bad for us or bad for the environment or both. Now, depending upon what is burning, again, the, the, the type of smoke we get does, does matter and it does change. What we need to know are just a couple of things. So. Polymers from aromatic polymers, what does that mean? That means that we have green structure. Uh, most notably, benzene in the polymer. And those ones, because of the structure of that ring, are going to be a lot harder, a lot more energy to, to burn them off um, compared to normal chains. So we're gonna get a lot more smoke off of them. Polystyrene materials are also gonna produ produce more soot than polyethylene and and honestly, that comes back to this idea. Polystyrene has that six member ring on it. So even though the chain itself is mostly aliphatic, it does have a side group on it that is green. Whereas polyethylene, we're just talking mostly about just chains of carbon and mostly hydrogen along the way. General rule of thumb for us is that the more smoke that is created, the more particulates and those uh, nasty kinds of side effects can come into your lungs. And so that is going to increase the hazard overall. And so we can kind of imply from this that the simpler the molecule is, the less chance it's going to have smoke, the less chance it's going to be as dangerous. Still not great. Uh, again, if you're if you're looking at just plain old polyethylene, you're still going to run into um, just kind of the general dangers overall of having a whole bunch of carbon and hydrogens that are not burning completely. So we're going to have carbon monoxide at the very least. Whether you have any other things, it well, depends on what's attached to it. There are some regulations that are in place that are related to um, textiles and fabrics. Um, the, flammable, the Flammable Fabrics Act um, allow, allow the 
Consumer Fraud Safety Commission to establish explainability standards um, for textiles and other products. Um, California, uh, which is usually at the head of all regulations, or at least the pilot test group for most of them, um, they are in the business of regulating flame retardant stuff now. So, one of the things that they have gone after are um, foam padding in silver sleeping products, um, particularly ones that are had, that contain chlorinated organophosphates, because there has been a link. Um, between those substances and uh, potential health hazards, not only for the children, but also for their caretakers. And so the organophosphates are actually there to, um, as a flame retardant piece, to help the mattress not catch on fire in the event of a fire. Um, but unfortunately, the flame retardant material, um, the chemical that they treat the foam with, um, does have some issues with it. And in the state of California, if you have any consumer product that has links to cancer or um, developmental defects or pretty much any health hazard, it is by law required to have a warning label on it. And that warning label details the, the list of possible things that are associated with exposure. Okay, so we're at the point now in the chapter where we're getting into specific examples. So we're, we're done with kind of the broad overview of kind of the chemistry and the regulation. So with this section, uh, once again, just like the last one in chapter 11, I caution you, not everything on the slide here is going to be extremely valuable to your study or would show up on the final. We need to kind of just highlight the snapshots. What is it? What is it used for? What are the specific dangers? So we're going to start with fibers, those that are of natural sources. So for example, cotton and linen, these are vegetable fibers. These are derived from plant-based sources. Wool and silk are animal fibers. They're derived from either uh, the hair of animals, um, like sheep in the case of wool, or the byproduct of a secretion of a particular type of worm in the case of silk. Now, regardless of the source of fiber, we can make textiles from them directly, or we can do some chemical alterations to the natural product to produce synthetic fibers. Now, because they come from natural sources, these textile precursors are going to have natural oils because, again, they were associated with a living thing. The natural oils come from that living thing. And as a result, they are flammable or at the very least combustible. And because of that, DOT has to regulates that you have to mark them as such. Depending upon their flammability and the flashpoint, they have to either be marked as combustible substances or as flammable substances. The first one we're going to talk about in depth here is cellulose. This is one that has become considerably more popular over the last 15 years or so. This is a polymer that is derived from woody plants and, and certain types of grasses. Um, it is the primary component of the cell walls of plants. It's what gives plants their structure, is their cellulose. So you remember back to biology class in high school, 
difference between animal cell, cells and plant cells is that cell wall. That cell wall gives it the rigidity of, you know, allowing it to stand up on its own like a plant does. Now, we don't need to get into the details here. This is kind of a fun fact, but cellulose is basically derived from a sugar called glucose. Glucose is something that we are familiar with. It is the simplest of sugars, or at least a simple sugar to us. Um, however, cellulose is in the range of 7,000 to 12,000 repeating glucose units. So the structure of cellulose itself is very large. It's a very heavy macromolecule by comparison. What we know about it is that those substances that are cellulosic will burn without melting, but they don't really burn super fast. You usually easily extinguish fires of cellulosic materials with water. Now, when it comes to being heated, we can see cellulose acting in two different ways. Somewhere around 6,300 Celsius, um, at any temperature below that, we will see the depolymerization of the cellulose, the elimination of water, so it's going to actually absorb water as it breaks apart. And what we get is this slow burning kind of ashy, result kind of the smoldering not terribly intense in its flame at higher temperatures we'll actually see the ther the cellulose thermally degrade when it does it turns into a kind of gooey par kind of consistency that gooey tar consistency converts to a series of hydrocarbons, all of which are flammable. So the conversion of those hydrocarbons, the mixture of those hydrocarbons with oxygen, ultimately is what starts the fire to be considered. From a synthetic standpoint, so let's say that we're not just using cellulose, but rather treating the cellulose to make other products. Um, you can have what is called cellulosic acetate. This is a wood cellulose that has been reacted with um, acetic acid. Um, this is known as acetate rayon. Plain old rayon is derived from wood pulp that has been treated with sodium hydroxide and then treated again with carbon disulfide. And then nitrocellulose, which can go in a couple of different directions. One of them is in the explosive range. The other one is what goes into making patent leather shoes is basically cellulose that has been treated with nitric acid. Again, depending upon the purification process and how it is handled afterwards, those are the two primary avenues that it goes down. On one side, you, you have the markings of a chemical explosive. On the other one, you get into the making of um, not leather, but plasticky looking leather that usually have, or other kinds of products that are usually quite shiny. On the animal side, um, let's talk about wool and silk. We are looking at um, these as kind of the most common animal fabrics, uh, fabrics. In wool, you're talking about primarily the 
care of most commonly sheep, but also we get similar kinds of properties with goat's hair and with llamas and alpacas as well. Um, in silk, you're talking about the um, fibers produced by the silkworm. The silkworm is a type of moth. The actual nature of these um, polymers are protein based. Um, these are actually derived from uh, amino acid and, and, and protein kinds of construction. Their ignition temperature is on the lower end of the scale um, uh, compared to the Sonosa product, 570 Celsius over 1,050 Fahrenheit. When they burn, we get similar kinds of properties though. We see smoldering, we see charring. Generally speaking, we can put this out with water. No real big deal. All right, so we'll end today by introducing probably the biggest class of polymers of them all. And that is the vinyl polymers. With the vinyl polymers, what we are talking about are polymers made from one or more vinyl compounds. The vinyl compounds being those ones, like what we talked about as examples of addition polymerization, where I've got Usually, some form of this ethylene compound, B2H4. Now, all of these different vinyl polymers kind of as its backbone. What we will see different is that these hydrogens attach will change and vary based upon the actual identity of the compound itself. Now, there are lots of different final polymers. Um, the one being featured here, vinyl chloride vanillidine chloride copolymer. Uh, so kind of, we got a, a, a con, not quite a condensation polymer, but it does have varying repeating units. Um, trade name for that is saran. Most of us are familiar with saran. Saran is the plastic um, that is what we call plastic wrap. Um, so, saran is a very versatile product. We can mold it into sheets, we can mold it into tubes, rods, fibers, other things. When we spin it into fibers, those fibers can be put into textiles, which can be made as part of carpets, curtains, upholstery, a whole bunch of stuff. <clears throat> And so where we'll begin on Friday is we will start looking at the vinyl polymers, um, starting in particular with polyethylene. And uh, with polyethylene, we've got probably the most common of the vinyl polymers. Um, as you can see, there are a number of different forms of plastic that are derived from this. So that's where we'll kick off on Friday test on Wednesday. That'll be the only thing that we do. Otherwise, have a good day.